Welcome to CMMS Radio, a podcast, blog site, and general resource for all things CMMS, computerized maintenance management software, from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey. We'll bring in experts along the way to help us learn more about CMMS, facilities operations, and much more. If you need help with the CMMS project, send a message at cmmsradio.com using the What's On Your Mind link. Suggest a topic, share your CMMS story, or ask questions. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Today, we have the pleasure of being joined by Brian Jolly. He is the VP of Facilities, Operations, and Maintenance at HES Facilities Management. He's a certified educational facility professional, educational facility professional, facilities management professional. He has a bachelor's in facility and property management and an MBA from Brigham Young University with over two decades in the FM space. HES is America's premier provider of facilities management for educational institutions, servicing over 125 million square feet with daily custodial services, groundskeeping, and facilities operations. There's actually a longer list than that on their website if you want to check it out. So, Brian, welcome to CMMS Radio, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's awesome to be here with you, Greg. Yeah, and I, I you know, I really wanted to have you on the show because I've had the pleasure of working with you for a few years now on a few different projects, you know, several occasions where we've met, we've had these discussions about facilities and all these things. And I wanted to kind of bring that insight that I feel that you have to the show and anybody that listens to it or watches it to really get a feel for that. I think, I think you're a true expert in what you do. And I'd like to know first, what brought you to the FM space initially and how did you get so good at solving problems in facilities, operations, and maintenance? <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the question. Um, you know, honestly, I started my career in construction. Um, so I was building hospitals around the country, really liked the healthcare space. Um, and I found myself, particularly when we were doing a lot of the remodel work on hospitals, the guy that I was always interacting with or the customer I was always interacting with was a facility manager, right? Um, and I just happened at, uh, you know, I was probably 29, 30 years old and <clears throat> talked to uh, one gentleman is a facility manager in, in Arkansas. And I said, how did you get to be in this position, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, most of the guys end up just inheriting this, right? That I've, I used to fix the boilers and I worked on this and that, and I just inherently grew up into the system and, and became the, the facility manager. He said, but interestingly enough, there's a program out there that's world known um, at Brigham Young University. So the, the facility and property management degree program. And, and um, I happen to grow up in Utah. Um, so I'm very familiar with BYU and, and uh, looked into that. And I actually left my career uh, married with four kids. Uh, moved into the, stu the married student housing on campus and uh, got my facility management degree. Um, and uh, it, it, it's been great. Um, I, I really, really enjoy the whole aspect of the built environment, right? That's why I love construction so much. Uh, I love working in the healthcare. Um, but I think the thing that I really gained from the education is that we're more in the people business than we are in the building business, right? I think people kind of forget that when they hear the, the term facility manager and um, yeah, we, we do clean toilets. Yes, we mop floors. Yes, we fix air conditioners, but we do all that for the sake of people. Um, and so uh, I really got a great education there and, and went out into the, the world. Um, while I was at BYU, I, I had a, a mentor of mine um, Doug Christensen was his name. Um, very familiar in, in the Apple world. Most people in Apple know him. Uh, he really uh, showed me that education was the place for me. Um, so he mentored me in, in a way that I have, have really have a fondness for the education uh, facilities world. And I've been in it ever since. 
Um, so that, that's kind of where it's, it, it's brought me. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> it does. It does. And what, what I like that you brought up there is the mentorship because we've had some other conversations as it relates to that mentorship. And mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to bring up today was you still have not only involvement at Brigham Young University, and you also participate in Facilithon. You're involved with that as well, I believe. And you're big on mentorship and the cultivation and essentially bringing up, raising up, if you will, the future of facilities, maintenance, these, these well, newer newer players in the space are actually being developed and kind of brought up so that they can hopefully prevent a gap that a lot of us have talked about that we see coming where we're going to lose tribal knowledge when people retire. Uh, we're going to have lack of visibility on processes and whatnot. So I'd love to get your take on how you approach mentorship, whether you're working with some folks at the Brigham Young program or you're doing something with Facilithon and what are some of the things that that you that you do and that you find so rewarding about that part of what you do now well genuinely I believe my success is based on other success um, so I I really feel strongly about helping others succeed in this business um you know, we've got a lot of uh, young interest, which I love seeing. There are a lot of young people who are, who are showing interest. I'm especially um, excited to see more young women uh, involved in this industry because it really has been a male-dominated industry, um, and, and we, we need that. There is a place for women in this industry, and we need to help them um, be there. Um, but like I said, my, my success is there, so I... I go over routinely um, twice a year. I go to the facility management program at BYU um, and I do a seminar where for an hour I speak and whatever topics they want to discuss. Um, I tend to do some recruiting selfishly, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And include them to show them what we do and see who's interested. And um, we've recently been able to hire three BYU graduates. Um, all have been placed in positions of leadership and are, thriving uh, in the industry. Do they know everything coming out of school? No, no one does, right? Uh, but they are gaining some great experience and we're putting people in place such as myself and, and others in the organization who can mentor them, uh, who can answer questions, who can help them feel confident in making decisions. Um, that That's a big part of this business is that you've got to be able to make decisions in a fairly short amount of time um, without having to wait for everyone else to have an input. Um, now, education isn't always that way, especially higher ed, right? It's, it's always decision by committee. Uh, but it's, it's not so much in, in the facility management world. There are things that occur on a campus that you've got minutes to make a decision. Um, and like I tell all, all these young people, um, I'd rather you make a decision and it's not the right one or didn't come off right then making no decision and have things fall apart around you, right? It, it, it really is just trying to encourage them to feel confident that they're trying to do the best they can. Um, so that, that, that's it. Um, we've, we have an internship program that we've started last year, last summer. Um, one young man came and worked for us and he, he now is full time with us as a director. He's running a full facility site for us in Nevada. We have two other young men who have joined us who um, are in what we call our leadership training. Uh, so both of them are, are an assistant role and, and working closely with the directors on site and helping to support, manage, and operate uh, the, the built environment. So there's a lot of that. But I, I, I would say all in all, I, I really enjoy watching people be successful, right? Whatever it is. And, and my success isn't theirs. So we always talk when we start these mentorships, what do you see as a success, right? What does success mean to you? Let's go down that road because what I think success is 
could be a completely opposite road for someone else. So, um, you know, Simon Sinek, you've probably heard the name in, in business. He's got a book out called Start With Why. Um, I, and I think that's such a, a vital part of this business. Like you, you have to know deep down why you want to do this or why you are doing this. Um, because otherwise it, it it's just going to eat you up, right? And no one calls you in facilities management to, to thank you and, and wish you well. <laughs> they call you because things aren't working and they want you to fix it now. Um, so if you understand that, you understand that your, your success or why you do what you do is to really help people feel comfortable, feel comfortable. Or for me, it would be helping educate the youth, right? I, I love being a part of the educational facilities because you really are a part of students learning. Um, the, the space has to be clean. It has to be safe. It has to be a, a, an environment in which they can learn. Um, and, and those are awesome tasks to be a part of and, and really in helping students to learn. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot in everything you said there, because when we look at facilities of any type, as we're moving through the world, I think a lot of people in general take it for granted how critical it is that these things not only get done, but get done right. And that the people that are doing these things have that sense of empowerment and they actually have even stronger self-efficacy, their, their own personal knowledge that I can do this. And when they're being mentored or when they're part of HES, they've got people on the team from leadership, like throughout laterally and upwards, downwards to support and actually make that happen for them. But what you don't do, and, th and this is what I like so much is, you don't forget about them in the process. It's mm -hmm. almost like what they're doing, what they're going towards, what they're trying to achieve becomes the priority for you. And therefore you get the outcome that you want for your clients, for those employees, for those people. And it feels very, very intentional. And it also is filled with or imbued with this, this kind of, I almost want to say uh, goodness. Like it's, it's about achieving something together so that everybody wins together, but you never forget that you're raising people up that are going to carry the torch. Exactly. If, if that's fair. So we, we have to talk about CMMS a little bit. Now I don't want to talk about specific products necessarily <laughs> because yeah, some, sometimes I want to talk about a product. Sometimes I want to talk about a process, but for you with, you've got, well over two decades of experience with all of this. You've seen a lot of different systems out there. You've used them. So one of my questions was, how has the utilization of CMMS platforms empowered you, these great employees and teams that you work with and help bring along, and the, of course, clients? How does that really help you deliver what you deliver at HES? Because HES delivers a level of service that is in my opinion, high. It's, it's, a, it's the highest standard of what you're going to see out there. And th this is not, for everybody out there, this is not to, you know, shout from the mountaintops. It's something that I see, I observe, I've experienced it, and I think it's important to understand how does CMMS play a role in your ability to do that? Well, it's, it's a vital part, right? Um, it's a tool that helps us communicate where we are, what we're doing, when we're doing it, and to the full extent of why. Um, the CMMS system, the data that's being collected helps everyone in making decisions. Um, everyone in this industry, particularly education, they want data-driven decisions, right? They, they want some sort of data to develop how they move forward. That's a very educational academic mindset. So it is vital for our business and how we do what we do. Um, but the, the system that, that we use, if implemented right, right, we, we are easily able to kind of focus on productivity, right? How many of the work orders that are being generated are truly being utilized or, or worked on by our staff? They're paying for 40 hours a week. How many of those hours are going towards work orders? 
are the work orders corrective? Are they preventative maintenance? Are we spending more of our time fixing things? Are we spending more of our time keeping things running so they don't break down? That's a conversation, right? Um, so the, the way that particularly in my um, purview and what I do for my company, managing that operation and maintenance component cannot work well without a CMMS system. It just, it can't. Um, it has to be a clear communication to the customer. How are we doing what we're doing? When are we doing it? And are we really bringing value to what they're trying to accomplish? Are we showing that we're extending the life of their equipment based on the preventer maintenance? Or are we showing that we're doing, you know, we're, we're doing nothing but corrective and, and reactive work because the place is falling down around us, right? Um, I can say that all day and I can write it in letters and emails, but when you have data and you have a CMMS system that shows all of that, it's a much easier conversation to have. So it, like I said, it, it is vital for us to be able to use and operate a, a, a clear CMMS system that, that provides that reporting that we need. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's actually well said because when I think back to the times that we didn't have or maybe it wasn't as common for an organization of any type to have and utilize a CMMS platform, you're doing all the old school methodologies where you're still trying to get it done and everybody's really trying to perform, but absent that data, which all of it is actually really critical, it can, it can start to show not just the institution that you're servicing in your organization, but all the different players that are involved, what's really happening. You, you eliminate blind spots, you, the data driven decision process or, or preference towards that type of decision making. It's the thing because the data, if it's good data, will give you the information to make those proper steps for your process improvement. You, you want to get faster. You want to get better. And, Data will tell you how to do that if you know how to use the data. One of the things I want to ask you about CMMS platforms in general with what you do and what you've seen over all these years is are there certain challenges to the process of implementing and using a CMMS platform in what you do that you've encountered and how have you overcome them? Yeah, I, you know, it's the old saying garbage in garbage out, right? It, if, if you're not having clear communication as to what you want out of the system before you put something in it, uh, it's going to be very difficult to ever get a report that, that you want or the cu customer requires, right? So mm -hmm. KPIs, for instance, uh, if, if there are KPIs that, that they're requesting, you have to know what those are and how you're going to get the information to provide that. Um, so knowing that up front is, is always going to be key, but implementation of these systems, I, I got to tell you, we've, I've done dozens of these um, in, in schools all over the country. Um, and what it really boils down to is, are you working with an organization that is providing you a clear back and forth communication as to how things are going, what they're missing or what they need, and are you conveying what you need, right? So the, the implementation there are people in the back room who are doing the software, doing the, you know, all of the codes and all of that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. That is important. But if they don't know how many floors are in that building with, the, you know, the floor types or whatever the, the stuff that is that you have to track, it's meaningless. It, 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 it's the old school way. You know, when I first got into this industry, there was probably a couple dozen CMMS systems out there, right? And and they were pretty pricey. Um, and at that time, like, I, I would say maybe 50% of the universities had purchased CMMS systems, but only 10 to 12% were actually using it. Everyone else just set it up on the shelf. It's like, hey, we have a CMMS, but it's it's on the shelf. It's not actually being used. And, and we're seeing that switch now, right? Everyone's now getting on board that these things are, are important. Um, but again, the, the, the old school mentality was um, we, we need to keep the information to us. It's, it's our information. No one else can have it. We don't want 
um, anyone to have it because they might see our weaknesses or, or whatever it is, right? Um, and, and boy, that we have to reject that mindset. Um, transparency in facility maintenance is so important. Um, I hear all the time from organizations, we need more people, we need more people. We'll prove it. How do you prove that you need more people? Just because they're beating you up that you're not getting your work orders done? That that doesn't prove anything. That just There's a myriad of reasons why that could happen, right? But if you have a good, clear CMMS system that's documenting the hours worked, the work orders that they're working on, are they all clearly just hitting reactive every single day and can never get to the PM? Well, that is a clear case that you need more people, right? Whereas you 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 got so many work orders and the guys are sitting around or there's just so much that you can answer with this um, in, in clearly in the way that you do your business. Um, and it has to be transparent. I, I can't overemphasize enough how much uh, your customer has to have access to your system. This is not a trade secret. It should never have been a trade secret. This is their buildings. This is their equipment. This is their assets. So we, we've got to get away from this idea that we're, we're we got to hide their information or we only share what we want to share, right? Um, because I find, I have found quite often with higher ed and any of the school districts, when you're honest, they want to work with you. When it looks like you're constantly hiding something from them, they're going to find someone else to work with, right? Uh, so. It's, it's really interesting when I think about what we've been discussing today and early on, you were talking about what we really do. So this is part of that. It's, it's inside of that perspective that if it's actually about human relations, relationships, if that's what it's actually about, then necessarily more transparency is going to allow for everyone to have more influence and actually see what's happening. And as far as, you know, things like trade secrets and, oh, well, I don't want our customers to see what we're doing and when we're doing it, those, those days are gone because there's a different expectation. And I think some of that feeds into this big generational shift that I think we're seeing, we're experiencing. Some of us don't want to, don't want to acknowledge it. Mm. And I understand that as well. Sure. But if you have, let's say, for example, and I'm not saying I'm right here. I'm just throwing this out there. You've got a lot of 20 and 30 somethings and they move through the world in a different way. It doesn't mean that when they walk, they don't put one foot in front of the other, just like anybody else, just as a generalization, all that stuff. But there is a way that they move through the world and they know what to do with information. And I think people in general, always, the more they know, they develop more willingness to proceed. Because you can never know what the future holds, but you can sure the heck hedge your bets if everybody's got the same information, right? Sure. So I really like that. And I really like what you said much earlier about this is really about people. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, every day, and I don't care if anybody agrees or disagrees with this. This is just to be more about a thought, right? It's, it's, it's for you to consider and contemplate that if we're taking care of the people, which is the same as taking care of our customer, then our customer is feeding our business so that our success can become determined based on their success. That's that full circle, win-win, elusive win-win. I've said it for years, and it has to be part of your DNA. If it's part of your DNA, then that necessarily means, in my opinion, that it's part of theirs as well. So you, you, get, you get the boat moving in the same direction, and I think that's really, really important because when people have information at the ready and it's the real information, they can proceed with a very high level of confidence, even if they're wrong. So, you know, 
I get going sometimes and I'll, I'll, I'll start stepping up on the soapbox. And I think well, I would I, say it, it allows it to go faster too, right? Um, there's so much that gets bogged down because of information. And you're absolutely right that the younger generations know how to access information quickly. They know how to get a hold of it. They know how to learn from it and they know how to use it, right? Um, and it, it's important that we recognize that. Uh, because there's a lot in the future, I think, that we're going to have to, we're going to have to move faster. And if we're not, you know, flexible enough to see that, we could be left behind, right? Th those who have that old school mentality are going to get left behind. Yeah, you. we have to adapt and we have to continue to improve unless we get indicators that suggest otherwise. And those indicators sure. have to be strong and verifiable and that requires data. Absolutely. So, I think we're on the same page there. Yeah. So another question I have for you, and this is more about a little bit current, a little more about future, kind of mix those together. What do you think the role of artificial intelligence will be in facilities management, facilities operations within CMMS platforms? Just a generalized view in your opinion on is AI going to play a significant role in maintenance? And if so, how do you see that unfolding? Look, absolutely. Um, I, I don't see why it wouldn't, right? Especially as you start to kind of look at controls, uh, the internet of things. Everyone has access these days where you can, I, I've got a technician who lives you know, in, in Las Vegas, Nevada, who's looking at the boiler in Anderson, Indiana, right? And he can do that through the internet. Um, so having uh, artificial intelligence get involved is, I think it's it's actually exciting. Um, kind of to my point earlier, it, it's going to speed up a lot of the processes and how we can do the work that we do, uh, particularly in the maintenance world. Um, it's going to help us uh, diagnose things that can occur or may occur well before they do and allows our teams to say, you know what, the, these are the PMs that we've got to work on, but based on what the artificial intelligence is saying, we need to change our priorities and shift to this work because this is where we see or where they see that the failure may occur or whatever that may be, right? Um, and, and then just in the business as a whole, there, uh, robotics, right. Um, er, I, there are a lot of people out there trying to sell these, um, commercial grade, um, vacuums and, and floor care and, and, um, you know, with COVID the sprayers and, and the UV lights, and th there's so much that, that come from that and how you can design, develop, and operate that and take that information back and make better decisions on, um, you know, is, is, are we really doing it the right way? Is there a better way to do that? So I, I absolutely see AI getting involved. Do I think that they're going to be um, more involved with the day-to-day -day, um, work orders? No. Uh, you, you can't replace a skilled tradesman. Um, you, you just can't. Um, there are things I've got gentlemen and, and ladies who work for me who can walk into a, uh, a boiler room and instantly know what's what's going on just based on what they hear, what they smell, what they see. Um, can you teach that to something or, you know, can a robot learn some of that or, or artificial intelligence? Maybe. Um, but there's still the human factor that has to be involved in wrench turning and and you know, blowdowns and, and doing all that kind of work that, that we have to do regularly to keep uh, uh, the assets moving and running. I agree. And it's a, it's a common question I'm asking of late in various conversations because it's really all about that human element. And I think the consensus is, you know, a lot of people are concerned about things like, oh man, AI is going to it's just going to take over and it's eliminating jobs and all these types of things. Well, it's actually not really in place for that as much as it's in place for amplifying that human element. And 
I think that's the best way to look at it. You're not going to take away. There's certain advantages to the human element that you're not necessarily mm-hmm. going to see in AI, not right now anyway. And it's more about amplifying the data interpretation of data and give you good indicators and supremely strong. Wow. That's just <laughs> supremely <laughs> a really strong kind of, kind of view of what to do next it'll enhance that but you still need that human element to kind of temper that a little bit if you will now a question i have this is more about hes what are some of the unique advantages to an educational institution whether it's just a school school campuses multiple campuses or even including medical because some of these schools and universities have Mm -hmm really critical medical facilities. What are things that those clients get with HES that are unique and they wouldn't get with other providers? Good question. Um, You know, our, our founders um, spent a great deal of time of trying to understand or, or at least develop what we thought would be uh, the differentiators, right? What, what would make us stand out? Um, I, I would Initially, I would point to our core values, um, going back to the people. Uh, it, we have five core values that we always talk about. We have our teams talk about them daily um, because they mean so much to who we are. And we want our people, specifically those who work for us, know that we want them to be examples of this wherever they are in our business. Um, their, their personal accountability, service above self, integrity, engagement, and respect. Um, we, we want everyone to be accountable for themselves and no one else. We want them to serve the customer above anything else, right, that we're serving. Uh, we want them to show integrity, be honest in all that you do. We want them engaged in their work, and we want them to show respect. Following those core values really defines a lot of what we do and why we do it. Um, we spend a great little time looking for what we call partners, right? We're not looking for customers. We're not looking for clients. We're looking for partners because the business is really about a partnership. We've got to work side by side in developing, designing, and implementing whatever those processes, those procedures that are related to that specific site. Um, and, and so we, we spend a great deal of time from that, um, and, and look, I've, I've seen that we've been in conversations with um, uh, potential partners and it was very obvious we weren't going to be partners and we we thanked them for their time and, and we, we went and found someone else, right? There, there's a lot of that that goes on. Um, but again, there, there's a lot of experience. Our sole business is education. We, we don't do anything else. That's We don't want to do anything else. We don't, we don't do you know, food service. We don't do uniforms. We don't do all these other side hustles that maybe some of our competitors do, right? That's not our core. That's not our business. We do facility management for educational facilities. Um, And our customers really like the fact that that is what we do. That's our core. And that's what our focus is going to be. Uh, We're not trying to sell them anything else. Right. I think that that makes a big difference right there being able to go all in on what you're absolutely best at because when you're out there in the business world in your personal life and you're trying to solve a problem you're going to you're going to need a specialist that understands that problem in every possible way and You need that same individual or organization and their team members to be in a position to constantly improve that. That way you're getting the absolute best solution to the problem that you have. And that's really important. A lot of organizations won't do that, can't do that, and there's some risk there until until you actually – show and develop the prowess and true expertise and reputation for delivery every time out. And that I think 
what we're kind of both talking about is that's what actually matters. So if you're looking for an outcome, you need a specialist to deliver that outcome and carry that outcome in a sustainable way moving forward. Because that keeps everybody moving in the same yeah. direction. And if you're doing too many other things, ad hoc things, side hustles, as you put it, or these, these extraneous things where, well, we can create a revenue stream here, we can create a revenue stream there. At some point that might make sense, but a lot of times it's much better to not have that. Yeah. It's, it's just the service kind of falls apart, right? Because then the focus is really more on how do we get more of this work? How do we get more of this money and less on how do we retain and, and really develop a partnership with these folks? We, we have some rare sites. We've been with partners for 30 plus years, and, and that's pretty rare in our industry, right? That, um, that it, quite often you get the five-year turnover and the RFP goes out and then the next guy and the next guy, whatever that is. Um, but we, we have multiple sites that are 20 plus years um, and, and a couple over 30. And it really is, again, we, we genuinely just want to be a partner. We want to be in this business. We want to be with them in their successes and support them as, as they go through tough times um, and, and come out the other end as true partners. I really like that. I think, I think I can relate to it in a lot of ways because some of the things I've done in my life, even if I'm not doing those exact things anymore, I happen to know that there's people and clients of those situations or solutions that for that high number of years are still doing that. Mm -hmm. And it feels really good to deliver like that. And I know everything's about a number at some point, all well, that of course. Kind of stuff, but of course. The, to, to sustain long-term relationships like that, it suggests that a lot of things are being done right. And there's a lot of value being delivered and that's really what matters. So, very important for me to make sure everyone knows how can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more about HES or they want to learn more about what you do with Facilathon or just to start one of their own conversations. What's your preferred method for people to reach out to you? Well, they certainly can go out to HES.com and look at look us up. Um, click on, look at the leadership, get to know some of us. Um, again, everyone in the leadership has been in this industry for multiple, multiple years. Um, uh, they are certainly welcome to reach out to me at bjolly at HES.com. Um, and, uh, you know, anytime anyone has a question, I'm more than happy to answer it. I, I tell the students at BYU all the time, you may not come work for me. I, I, I don't really mind who you work for, right? Go out there and, and make your living. But if there's anything I can do to help you, call me. Even if you work for a competitor, doesn't hurt my feelings at all, right? I, I want to see people succeed in this business. And if that means I can answer a question or provide a solution or steer someone in the right direction, I, I am all on board. I'm more than happy to be involved with that. Thank you for that. And that's, that's really great. And I, I want to also thank you for spending the time today and sharing all these insights. I think we'll do it again in the future. And until next time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. I really appreciate it. This is fun. My pleasure. And thanks again for being here. Perfect. Did you find this episode helpful? please send us some feedback, suggest a topic, or ask a question, and follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. Reach out to CMMS Radio if you need a co-pilot on your CMMS project, and keep listening to CMMS Radio. Do you have a CMMS story? We'd love to hear it. Visit cmmsradio.com and use the What's On Your Mind link. Thank you for tuning in to CMMS Radio, your resource for all things CMMS from selection to implementation to help you make better choices, learn from industry experts, and have a successful CMMS journey.